Today's episode of Hidden Forces is made possible by listeners like you. For more information about this week's episode or for easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you listen to the show on your Apple Podcast app, remember, you can give us a review. Each review helps more people find the show and join our amazing community. And with that, please enjoy this week's episode. What's up, everybody? I'm Dimitri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, where each week I speak with experts in the fields of technology, science, finance, and culture to help you gain the tools to better navigate an increasingly complex world so that you're less surprised by tomorrow and better able to predict what happens next. My guest this week is Raul Paul, a former global macro fund manager and a co-founder of Real Vision, a financial media company that offers in-depth video interviews and research publications from some of the world's most thoughtful investors. Raul talks, writes, and tweets about issues affecting global markets, currencies, trade, politics, and the business cycle. But most of this conversation deals with a theme captured in William Strauss and Neil Howe's generational theory, also known as the fourth turning, where the authors describe a four-stage cycle of social moods associated with recurring generational archetypes, which they call turnings. These include the high, the awakening, the unraveling, and the crisis. The question we explore in this conversation is, are we at the fourth turning? And if so, what does that mean for the type of change we can expect to see in the coming decade? This leads us into a discussion about global currency, Bitcoin, Libra, and the future of digital money in a multipolar world where the power of governments to maintain the global order is diminished and where corporations and the private sector may gain an opening to provide alternative forms of money in support of global trade and commerce. Where does Bitcoin fit in this world? What about alternative protocols and currencies? Will governments even allow them? Can they stop them? Or will they welcome them? And does this point the way towards a path that will lead inexorably towards truly global money? As always, subscribers to our Hidden Forces Patreon page can access the overtime to this week's episode, which includes a continuation of our conversation about digital currencies, but also a discussion about central bank policy at the Fed, the ECB, and the BOJ, as well as a discussion about economic indicators and what Raul relies on most for his own projections about where we are in the business cycle. Lastly, nothing I say on this podcast can or should be viewed as financial advice. All opinions expressed by me and my guests are solely our own opinions. And as is the case with all of my episodes, these conversations are for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for financial decisions. And with that, let's get right in to this week's episode. Raul Paul, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thank you. This is the first time you're on the show. I know. I had we talked to... about it for a long time, but I've not made it yet, but yeah, now I'm here. It's great. It's funny because you're in New York City a lot, but you're out of it a lot. You're kind of in and out. Yeah, always, <laughs> always. And it, your schedule's always packed when you're in town. Yeah, ridiculously. Yeah, I've been following your tweets. I mean, we've obviously known each other for some time. Yeah. Going back a number of years yeah, at least. Yeah, yeah. But I follow your tweets like a lot of other people. I really enjoy how carefully constructed your thoughts are on Twitter. You know? I, I try and think out loud on Twitter. Yeah. So for me, people say, well, why do you do this? There's a bunch of smart people like you're on there and you'll have your objective. Somebody else will have their idea. And to be able to think out loud and get people feedback from people that's honest and real feedback is super useful. Yeah. I also love that you don't offer life advice. <laughs> what do you mean? Because they're, you know, they're fund managers and stuff like that, or they give big sort of loopy philosophical ideas that feel kind of incomplete and a little self-gratifying. Or like Ray Dalio. I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> I, That's a different topic. I'm not going to get into publicly. There are a number of people. Maybe he's one of them, but actually there are some other ones that I was thinking of. And I appreciate that. And I also... And this is the sort of the pro and the con of the thread. You utilize this new thread feature on Twitter. Yeah. 
in a way that's useful for most people. But like, you know, there are people that go on and on. It's... <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's great. And it really helps me because I dip in and out of this stuff, right? Yeah. We talked a little bit before we started about how on Hidden Forces, I'll have an episode on politics. I'll have an episode on, you know, Eve Ensler, you know, all sorts of different people. So there are times when I'm not in it. I'm not focusing on what's happening. You know what I'm saying? So it's useful for me to have all this data out. I mean, I'm trying to pull together a picture. Your stuff is actually very helpful in giving me a coherent sort of take on that data. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I mentioned to you, I watched a number of your videos recently and some interviews you did, and you have this thing you call the doom loop. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So you need um, the dramatic music off. That, right? I, you do, like I told you, 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 I can't do it like you. You, you <laughs> cascade, it's like a waterfall. Help me, give me a sense. I mean, whether it's the doom loop, whether it's you know whatever else, what is your view on markets today? That's a big question. It took me an hour to answer it on Real Vision, and I only got a small portion of kind of how I'm my framework and where we are right now. So it's a really complicated thing. In its pure essence. We are at a reasonable high probability of going to recession. Global GDP growth is pretty much zero most, almost everywhere. The US is a little bit higher, but not much. We're trying to decide whether we're going into a recession or not fully. I think we are. And if we do that, then it changes the last 10 years of what we know. Now, that's okay, but there are some big banana skins that are there beneath the surface. One is demographics, because you've got the largest pool of people in history with the largest pool of capital in history, the baby boomers, at 65 years old, at retirement age, which is the average age of a retiree American. And if you have a recession, the stock market halves. And that would halve their all of their life's work in one day, or not one day, but one 18 month period, let's call it. And that behavioral impact is huge in terms of future consumption or also in terms of how they'd act because they don't buy market dips any longer. They become sellers because they're desperately trying They're to, rotating out of equities and into bonds. They just want their final pile of cash to retire in. And if it's shrinking every day, you panic more, right? A 30-year-old does the opposite. They should be thinking, I can put more money into the market. So you've got a very different behavioral choice there. So that's a big issue. We've obviously got the debt issues that have been going around the world and the governments and the amount of printing of fiat money and quantitative easing and all of this that we all know about. But then we've got this doom loop, which is essentially the last part of the rolling bubbles. We had the rolling bubbles, which was equities in 2000. Then we had the housing market and financial debt in 2008. It's the corporate debt market that's so big. Mm -hmm. And if you think of what happened we're supposed to be deleveraging. That was the story. But what's happened is the corporate market has levered up and doubled in size in terms of debt since the last recession. So we're now the global corporate debt to GDP is 90 something percent, 93 percent, mm -hmm. which is enormous. It's as much as household debt was at the peak of the bubble in the US. In the US alone, it's about, according to IMF numbers, 75 percent of GDP in debt. That's all well and good. The fact is, A, we're about to go into recession. Even if we don't happen this time around, it'll come, whether it's this side of the election or the other side of the election. But the problem is all of this debt is triple B. So 50% of the market is one notch below junk bonds. So that means you've got very weak holders of debt, which is the pension system, who would be forced sellers if anybody gets downgraded. And all of the concentration of that debt is amongst five firms. Would they have to change the regulations? <laughs> well, can they? Well, should they? Right. No, that's so. A, if it's your mum's pension, right? Right. Should she be holding the junk bonds of AT and T because AT and T? Did? No, you'd say. So it's complicated. Yeah. But the junk bond market beneath it is a trillion dollars, and the triple B market's four trillion dollars. So if twenty percent gets downgraded, there's no buyers. So in which case, the whole thing goes into into spasm. And again, the problem is with this is most of the bonds that got issued were to buy back shares. Mm. So the share market and the bond market being kind of in this- The corporate debt issuance was we used primarily to buy back equity. Exactly. So companies issue debt. Well, firstly, the management issues themselves share options. Then exactly. they issue debt, buy back their shares. Their shares go up. They get rich, which creates the 1% versus the 99, mm -hmm. clearly right there. Then what happens is, is as after they buy back, these companies get more and more levered as they're buying back all of the shares. 
Now, what's interesting on the debt side of the equation is who is the buyers of these debts? These are the bankrupt pension systems like Illinois. Now, Illinois doesn't have enough money to fund its pension system because it's got a big black hole, so it raised taxes. So it takes in new taxes. It gives them to the pension fund manager. The pension fund manager buys corporate debt. And so that is the whole nexus. So all of these retirees are owning this corporate debt and the equity market, which they they also own some of, and both parts of these are likely to fall in the next recession. Mm. And so it's terrifying on a personal level for the baby boomers, you know, on a human level, because this is actually terrible. Mm -hmm. But it's also systemic in its size because the whole market seizes up and the pension system essentially goes bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's that going on. And, and the other banana skin is the European banking sector, which is still part of the debt situation, never got cleaned up. So other than that, there's not a lot going on. <laughs> and the thing is also, of course, that's accompanied really crazy valuations and a lot of malinvestment, right? I mean, you've got a lot of companies that have equity valuations that are through the roof, and that doesn't even begin to talk about what's happened in the private space. Exactly. Right? Exactly. So the whole thing has gone through the roof. And a lot of that's been driven by the same thing, is is the baby boomers or the pension, the pension fund managers on their behalf have been essentially taking as much risk as possible to try and get their the pie yield. yeah to make up the yield to make it a larger pie so they can retire this is also like this touches on the perversion right because policymakers have their models about what happens during a crisis and what you need to do in order to alleviate the crisis which is drop rates they drop them to zero then they began to buy back assets in order to create liquidity but that actually had a perverse effect like you're saying a perfect example is corporations they could borrow in order to invest in plant and equipment but why would they do that? That's riskier than just buying back their own stock, right? Yeah. And they're tax incentivized to buy back their own stock over all other things. So why would they do anything else? Also, again, if you think of it through the, the law of the baby boomers, one of the classic problems the central bankers did is didn't look at demographics. So it's great to cut interest rates on a 40-year-old. It's a disaster on a retiree. Well, you've done some great public work in terms of communicating on the issue of structural demographics. You have a video that has, I think, over a million views online. Is that right? How yeah. many is that? Yeah, 1.3 million views. That video is fantastic. Thank you. And we didn't promote that. I, don't, I believe it. I believe. It well, first happened. of all, you can't promote to 1 million views. But I completely believe it because it's rhythmic. Besides the sort of the visuals of the video and everything else, there's a rhythm to your explanation that I think is very helpful. I don't know how else to describe it. But for those listening, we, we've done some work on this before, whether it was with Lacey Hunt or I can't remember. We've, we've done a bunch of stuff on demographics. But what is the issue with demographics right now? And how does that relate to equities and markets more broadly? Yeah, the issue is people in the 1950s and 60s, the baby boomers, were told they didn't need to save as much money as their parents. Because if you give them money to Wall Street in this thing called the pension, they'll do the saving for you. So if you think of the classic old model, it will be save 20% of your income until you retire, and then you retire, and you generally live in a multi-generational household. That probably worked for, I don't know, 2,000 years, 3,000 years. Mm -hmm. But then suddenly- Because your savings was also your kids. Exactly. And it was your future investment, right? It's a bond yield. Yeah, exactly. So what you got here, and some of them had optionality, because if your kid became a doctor, which is why every Indian wants their kid to be a doctor, or you know, it's classic, and it worked very well. Well, I told you I, I, Dr. Paul would work better for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, so the issue is, if you're not going to save 20% of your income, Wall Street told you a story. The story was, just give us the money. Give us 5%, 10%, and we'll turn it into lots more money. So you don't have to be like your parents, which was the austere generation, the, the great generation. So the baby boomers could reject austerity. Fantastic. So they went on a debt spree as well, which was the other thing that happened. So they went on a debt spree and they put money into their pensions. The 401k system and all of that kind of accelerated that process. What happened in the end is that was a lie from Wall Street. They didn't have as much money at the end to retire on. Those pictures of the grey-haired couple walking on the beach hand in hand weren't real. It was actually a pretty miserable existence when you added up your financial savings and the interest rates that apply now. Yeah, that's the you big You don't problem. have any money. Yeah. So you've got this massive shortfall. Okay, so then what happened was the pension fund managers started realising this, as did the households. So what was the answer after 2008? Actually, after 2000, was take more risk. It was the wrong answer. In Europe, they did the opposite. They started divesting out of equities, out of riskier assets. But in the US, they doubled up. 
and there were slightly younger populations. So now you've got a maximum risk-taking culture at retirement age. Well, isn't this also part of the problem and the perversion of a model that tells you to lower interest rates in order to spur economic growth when people that need savings will end up maybe saving more when their savings are yielding less? Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is a mess now. Now, it's very easy to say the problem started here or there. I don't know. The problem was by allowing too large a debt culture. Because when you allow too large a debt culture, you become slave to interest rates because you need low interest rates to be able to service your debt. And if you don't allow the right recession to come at the right time, so over management of interest rates, you've ended up destroying that. So it's all well and good for these kind of central bankish, hawkish types, the gold standard guys to say, well, they should raise interest rates to a proper... Well, you try raising interest rates to 6%, what you might think it should be, the world will implode. So it's not going to happen. People say, well, that's fine. It needs to rebalance. Yeah, it will rebalance. We all know it's going to rebalance. And it just depends which kind of rebalance you want to get. If you want to create total destruction, you could do that. I think we both know what kind of rebalancing we're going to get. There's no way that the authorities are going to let the system rebalance on its own. There's going to have to be some kind of wealth transfer that governments are going to attempt to try and manage because we've spent the last 30 or 40 years financing a world that we can no longer afford to live in. I mean, many people are wealthy because they own the liabilities of people who can no longer afford to pay them. And there's no way you're going to extract blood from a stone. So I think at some point, governments are going to have to step in and try and manage that transfer. And the rest of us are just trying to figure out how not to end up as part of the collateral damage. Yeah. But that transfer itself is a really complicated game because within it, I think, and I think you probably agree, is there is implicit new system that has to be built, right? Because you can't yeah, go so. back to the old system. So I think debt jubilee is what happens. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that's what kind of like MMT is about. Yeah. So and debt jubilee of, let's say, the Japanese first writing off all of their debt, i.e. the central bank buy the debt, forgive it to the government. So you're debt free as a country. Okay. Maybe they buy a bunch of corporate debt as well. So they clean up everything. Okay. Now, there is an outcome, even though the central bank can keep buying debt, so the debt market doesn't implode. The equity market probably does extremely well in that, mm -hmm. but there is the currency market, and the currency market likely collapses. Yeah. So that's very good for Japan if they do it alone, because if you could halve your currency right, and write export. off your debt, I mean, you are golden, right? You've got this old population, you know, you've got robotics and everything else, you have a productivity revolution, you are incredible. Problem is nobody else is going to allow them to do it. So in which case you have to manage like a global debt jubilee of some sort. I know these sound like crazy ideas, but we've been moving closer and closer towards oh, it. Oh, you're saying that it would be managed on a global scale? Has to be. That's interesting. And it has to be a new currency and financial structure. It's the Neil Howforth turning theory that comes People into People have told this. me to read that book. I have not read it. You've not Everyone, read it? Everyone's been oh, telling me to read resonate. it. It'll resonate. Everyone tells and me to read it. And it's this. There was no way we're going to, with a massive transfer of wealth, we will not stay with the old system. Because people will demand a change of system. I agree with that. I just and that I, is what all of this crypto, the whole world that we're looking at, the digitization of everything, is I think the new world, and it's staring us in the eye. And this is why I was super interested in what Facebook had announced, on not on the levels that everybody else was, but in a different observational level. So I do want to ask you about that. We'll get into that. My hesitation about, and other people have expressed this, about this period where the wealth inequality and the debt levels become unworkable, and therefore you end up having effectively monetization, whether you want to call it a debt jubilee or a wealth transfer or whatever. The issue I have is that we don't live in a world today that has a strong global order, right? We live in an increasingly multipolar world. Correct. And I'm not so confident that nation states are going to be able to come together in order to put forward a solution. Because you're making the assumption that the rules-based global order system is what needs to prevail. My interest is the fact that regionalization and polarization and bifurcation is actually what's happening. So there is no reason, if you were to have this set of opportunities, why would China not create a regional currency block based around Again, I'll use loosely the term cryptocurrency or whatever it may be. It's irrelevant for this point. We don't know is the answer, but something different, a different monetary system. I know a bunch of people would love it to be gold. Maybe gold's a part of it. I doubt it, but maybe it has a small part. But there is that. And then there's a US block and there's a different, you know, I don't see any reason why you can't have a multi-polarized world 
with multiple systems, which we've had in the past. That seems more plausible. That's interesting. So yeah. that's more what you mean. Yes. Now, can you have some form of global agreement to allow this to happen? It would bloody help to avoid war. Because doing this obviously increases the probability of war. And there are a lot of forces that are driving us in that direction as well. So this makes sense now, what you're saying, and why Libra is interesting to you. The reason Libra is interesting to me is because what it does is clever. Every other currency has a denominator. Mm -hmm. The denominator for all currencies is basically the dollar. Mm -hmm. Now, Libra doesn't because it's dollar plus all others. Mm -hmm. So what you have is a currency that doesn't move as a currency. What is the denominator? Is it inflation? Is it money supply? One of those two, are they the same thing? We can argue that all day, but what it is, it is a stable currency in mm -hmm. a true term. So this is better than any of the central banks have come up with, and a private sector could do it, and it can be managed. So what it creates is, okay, the genie's out of the bottle. This is the currency. Now, so that allows you as government A... What do you mean the genie's out of the bottle, this is the currency? Because the argument always was the government won't allow it. Yeah, but you are the US government and you want your taxes in dollars. Well, fine. You've got your dollars, but you're still part of this new currency, which is not dollars. Everything's based on a global currency, based on a global interest rate basket, and you know, because it was kind of global two-year rates, let's say, was that. So what you've got is this whole currency that only moves with the money supply overall. That's very interesting because that looks like a cryptocurrency for starters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not. As you know, it's not. No, it's not a cryptocurrency. Yeah, exactly. No, yeah, but, yeah. but it has the same kind of idea to it, which mm -hmm. is very difficult to massively inflate it or deflate it or change it or devalue it over time. So you have this thing. Because that, of the peg? Just, yeah, because of the multi-currency nature of the peg. And there is no peg. You've got nothing to attack because mm -hmm. it's all currency. So it's not versus the dollar. So in itself is is quite unique. Now, why the genie's out of the bottle is because governments can allow it because they're part of it. So you're not changing anything. It's like a swift payment system, essentially, but all in this globalized currency. But it also means that everybody can set one up. And why governments like it is I'm buying your debt. So I'm Facebook. I'm buying US government debt, and I'm buying Australian debt, and I'm buying Japanese debt, and I'm buying Chinese debt. So I'm actually not getting in your way. I'm working with you. So that is intellectually interesting. Again, I'm not suggesting for a second that this is the final outcome, but I'm suggesting that that is a massive move forward that I've not even seen anybody discuss before. Well, there are a number of projects that are trying to build or have tried to build stable coins. Yeah, but they do it against dollars. You're right. So you're saying in terms of... Well, they, there is one project... Because you're assuming the dollar is stable. Right. But what we're saying, really in the world of a debt jubilee, the dollar is not stable. Right, right, right. So what we're trying to say is what is stability in currency world... Well, stability in currency world is a managed supply of diversified risk, which would, that would be if it was dollars and yen and RMB and euros and pounds and Swiss francs, all in this basket. Well, it works perfectly if you're in Venezuela. People would adopt this as opposed to anything else. And then you have currency stability. Maybe there's no currency volatility left. Maybe it goes away entirely. But would dollar holders adopt that if that basket of currencies is worth less than the dollar? It depends what attributes you want. You know, it depends whether it's stability or exchangeability or, you know. Because it doesn't really need to be a store of value. I think the, the, They're all different things. Right. Because I think the I think we probably agree that Libra's real play is that it's offering frictionless medium of exchange money, right? No, I think it's bigger than that. Hmm. I actually think it is the medium of money. The store of value. No, because the store of value is a different thing. Right. But, I mean, but it is it's stability. Right. It is money with stability. And it is stable in terms of it can't collapse. Every country in the world would have to be printing excess money for it to collapse in value. And obviously, you still have relative assets of gold, real estate, commodities, and all the other relative but assets. But it could collapse relative to other assets, right? In other words, like if it's still backed by fiat money. Correct. So it seems to me that the play for Libra, as I've seen it, it's a medium of exchange with a billion users. I think that's sort of the play. Yes. And they're banking, they're banking on launching this thing with all those users in place. And then they're banking on all these developers that have been developing on permissionless blockchains that haven't been able to scale to come over to their project yeah. and help them build. That's Facebook. I'm talking about Libra as a concept. As a concept. As a construct and a concept mm -hmm. of what it is, which is basically a basket of all the world's currencies. Mm -hmm. That itself 
is, I think, more groundbreaking than Libra as a exchange mechanism. Mm -hmm. I don't really care about the exchange mechanism. I think India did a pretty good job with its payment system. There's a whole bunch of them out there. There's a number of ways you can solve that pie, but this solved actually something that nobody's solved before. So what backs the SDR? What is the SDR basket consisting of? Well, it depends what's in the SDR basket, but the SDR basket is against dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Essentially. It's mostly do the primary Yeah. And it doesn't, so it, it, looks like a, it looks like an SDR, but it's a private sector SDR, so anybody can right. issue it. Right. You know, it's not run by the IMF. Anybody can issue it because you're focused again. It's not on Facebook. It's Libra. I, so and it's not even your, Libra. So it could be Amazon control so their point, own. Okay. So I think I got where you're going. You're saying what's groundbreaking about Libra is that a corporation can issue a currency that's backed by all the other currencies in the world. Correct. Okay. That's interesting. Correct. That is stable. That okay. is incredibly okay, stable. Okay. I see what you're saying. So what does that mean for you? Where do we go from here then? What does that mean? So Libra launched, they put this out there, the genie's out of the bottle, as you say. Yes. A corporation can launch money that isn't just its own cryptocurrency, but actually is backed by the full faith and credit of all the nation's currencies in the world. Correct. Right? Or the strongest nation's currencies. Correct. Whatever right. it may be. Yes. So what's the big deal about that? Explain to me why that's significant for because you. Because then anywhere in the world, you have the same denominator, which is the global currency basket. Call it that. Call it Globex. Right? So that is the world's denominator for every asset. So what you're not doing is then if you're a Venezuelan and Africa, you don't have the disadvantage of your home currency or the advantage of your home currency. What you have is the stability of a globalized currency. So is what you're saying, if I'm following correctly, that the largest companies in the world were sort of developed either explicitly or inexplicitly a de facto protocol of creating their own currencies that are pegged to a basket of all the major currencies. And that way they're able to conduct business without the volatility that comes from exchange rates. And without the multiple payment system, without anybody saying it's a SWIFT payment system, I can cut down SWIFT. There's nothing you can do. You've created money that doesn't annoy governments. Now, again, it doesn't mean that this is its finalized form, but what it's telling you is anybody can create more types of money that have different use cases. So Bitcoin may have a sort of value use case, which is superior to this basket. Because with the basket, you've got the external influences, every single country, what they do with the printing of money. Okay, so that's not regulated like it is, let's say, in Bitcoin. So different types of money will have a different types of moneyness and different value propositions. And so we go into, if we talked about a multipolarized world with multiple regionals and a tribal world, you can have a different currency for everybody. But this kind of globalized currency ends up as the the nominator for all assets. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, I think I understand where you're going with that. It does seem to me though that it would be problematic for countries that have currencies that are consistently depreciating relative to this basket, right? If yes, they're engaged you still, in, you still, you, in relatively yes, inflationary so you still have, policies. So you still have policing of, yeah. of your own monetary policy. Yeah. But my guess is many countries would abandon their own currencies mm. Because if you can have this stability, you've got perfection. It's interesting. I need to think about your thesis more. It's not yet a thesis, but it's a developing right. thought process. Because when I looked at it, I was trying to say, what is the not obvious thing? Uh -huh. And the obvious thing was, well, it's Facebook, and I don't want to give them my data. You know, all of that stuff. Or Facebook, why should they be allowed? It's going to be used for money laundering. I just looked at it and thought, no, what is actually interesting here is the construction of that's the money That's very interesting. Itself. I mean, that's a valuable insight. It's not one that I thought much about. Because I am familiar with a number of other stablecoin projects, but you're right. This particular twist is interesting. I'd have to consider it more. What I came away with when I looked at Libra was I was basically looking at how the Bitcoin community was thinking about it, which was, oh, this is really bullish for Bitcoin, not just because it provides perhaps a medium of exchange for an unscalable cryptocurrency, but also it just proves the point that Bitcoin is really uncensorable. Because the only reason that Libra is getting in trouble or getting censored or all this shit's happening is because they're a corporation. And you can send a letter to Facebook, but you can't send one to Bitcoin. I actually don't think that's necessarily right. Yes, you can't send a, a letter to Bitcoin, but you can regulate the shit out of it. So I, I think for me, what's more interesting is asking the question, why did this happen now? Why such a strong reaction to Facebook, right? Yeah, a little bit because Facebook hating Facebook is in vogue. But I think it's actually because it would work. I think the reason that Libra has exacted the ire of the government is because it would actually work at scale. Now, it wouldn't be a cryptocurrency to work at scale, right? But it would work at scale. And so that got me into thinking, is it possible, and I have to consider what you've said, because I actually 
pose myself the question, is it possible to create a cryptocurrency independently of the government without antagonizing the government? And I came away, away with a temporary sort of, again, this is sort of a theory in progress that you cannot do that if it scales, if it is strictly a cryptocurrency. In other words, it would have to be a utility protocol. It would need to be along the lines of what Ethereum has hoped to create, but has been thus far unable to, and I think will not be able to, based on foundational scaling limitations of blockchain in permissionless environments. Because you're antagonizing the financial lobby without a built-in constituency. So if you actually had, let's say, a scalable Ethereum, an Ethereum that actually worked, where you could do all sorts of stuff like identity attestation and you know, building decentralized applications that run on your protocol, A, you begin to build a market for people that actually need this commodity and companies and everyone else, so constituencies. And also, too, your primary application is not the currency. So you're not coming out and straight saying, I'm going to take your business. Mm -hmm. Because I do think there's a path for utility protocols. So that was sort of where I was coming and, in from. And again, from what you're talking about, see, I don't see it as a one coin or one solution fits all. You know, whether it is hash graph, blockchain, and a number of other things, even, you know, everybody ignores it, but India won the whole bloody game in one go by its authentication system using, you know, fingerprint or retina scans. You can now buy a pint of milk in India, mm -hmm. right? And the payment system is extremely fast. It's not using blockchain. It's not using the same technology as everybody else. Now, is it as secure? It doesn't matter. Phase one for them is they process more payments than anybody else in the way that they did. It's an extraordinary growth. So I'm thinking that the world we're moving into, the new system, is a fragmented world too. And different things have different mm -hmm. values. As you say, some are utility, some are store of value, some are just mediums of exchange, some are just because they've been adopted. Some will be speculative, some will be non-speculative, some will be stable, some will not be stable. It doesn't matter. Because right now, in this world, you could have the Rottweiler owner's currency and the Chihuahua owner's currency, right. because anybody can issue their own currency. And it's valid. And you know, corporations issue their own currency. And then as you digitize all assets, which is what's happening, everything has a value and everything needs a value. And, and multiple kind of currencies is the only way you can do it. Because essentially what we're saying is equities that we understand for equities and bonds actually become currencies, which is crypto. Mm -hmm. Again, slightly all con it's a lot of conceptual stuff. But. Yeah. I mean, I think I follow you on some of those points. I think one area we definitely agree is on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. I think that it really ironically, as a result of its scaling challenges, the narrative has shifted. And I think Bitcoin's value proposition is like digital gold and as a hedge against systemic risk. I think that's what its real value proposition. But the question is, does it have that type of anti-correlation property? Because in the most recent dip that we had in late 2018, I saw Bitcoin dropped right along with the broader markets. And it's been integrated more and more into the mainstream sort of system. So what role does it actually serve? You know okay, I mean? so again, I'm rapidly changing my thought process all the time. And I'm surprised myself on how much I'm having to think on my feet as, as I'm learning new things and how fast this entire space is developing. I can't quite get my head around it, but I had a conversation on Real Vision that's out with Dan Tapiero. So Dan is an old school macro guy, known him forever, one of the smartest guys, worked for Drucker Miller, worked for Stevie Cohen, he worked for... Julian Robertson, he's worked for everybody, Michael mm -hmm. Steinhardt. And Dan has gone 100% Bitcoin, right? Yeah, he's gone, this is the biggest opportunity I've ever seen. Like all of these macro friends of mine, one after the other, after the other is going, okay, forget everything else. This is enormous. And I sat down with the real vision. He goes, okay, well, everybody's talking the wrong thing. Everyone's trying to find a reference point and an anchor point for understanding of a new system. And that everyone's anchoring on gold or sort of value or medium of exchange. And he goes, they're all wrong. I'm like, okay. What are you thinking? He's like, he goes, this is digital trust. And it is a, it's more ethereal. It's a much larger thing. So he's basically thinking it as a call option on the, on the new system. Now, as I said, I think it's a multi-fragmented system, but Bitcoin would be the one that would have to be the optionality of the entire system. Ethereum has its own value in its own case as, as things build, as does everything else. But his point is, okay, if this is what we think it is, what is that worth? And it's not worth a hundred billion dollars. It's not worth a trillion dollars. It's no. not worth probably a hundred trillion dollars. You know, the quantity of what it's worth. Okay. So if it trades like an option, 
So okay, it's so, a great bet. Is his point? Yeah, it's a great bet because it looks very clear with the amount of human capital and intellectual capital that's going into all of this space, the whole broader digitization and digital value in that whole space. Okay, I've never seen anything like it in my lifetime. I literally have never seen anything like it. And most people get cynical because they read a bit on Twitter and stuff about Bitcoin. They don't really understand the amount of intellectual capital that's gone into this and capital itself. So I know a lot of the things that are going on in that space. I realize how much change it is. So anyway, so there's that. Then there's another guy called Plan B. And this is, I'm just coming back to this, what people are thinking it is now. There's a guy called Plan B on Twitter. 100 trillion USD. Why is it called 100 trillion US dollars? Super interesting. What he did is bloody clever. And I've kind of found out a bit of who he is. He's anonymous. But what he did is built a very complicated stock flow model of gold, silver, copper, diamonds, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all these, I think he put Ethereum in, and basically built a stock flow model, which nobody's really done for gold either. But it managed to create a linear regression of a valuation of where this thing should go and how it trades versus its stock and flow. So you have this valuation matrix, and it works perfectly because things that have industrial uses don't act like gold. So gold is the most pure play. So they act slightly differently. And Ethereum acts like you know silver and copper, which is more industrial part precious, while Bitcoin trades exactly like gold. So when you put it on this line, again, it's deep maths of which I don't understand any of, but looking at what he's done, it basically trends exactly where it should do. So then he interpolated that onto a graph to show Bitcoin fair value versus how much is mined. And what he's got is this extraordinary model that works almost perfectly to show what it should be worth, which is when it gets to the last Bitcoin being mined, it's worth $100 trillion. And that's without it then having its value in its own right as a currency. So all of this... So but when is we're... that a fair comparison? Because there is a physical limit on gold unless someone figures out the alchemical equation to create gold out of lead or some other base metal. In terms of Bitcoin, it's software. There is no fundamental limitation on the supply in the way that there is for gold. There is a conventional limitation. But there is no fundamental technological limitation. Well, there is within the... I had this argument, right? This is why I sold my Bitcoin. It's like when I saw the forks, I said, Back okay. in the day. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, well, I saw the forks and I'm like, okay, this to me looks like... When you say you saw the forks, you mean uh, Bitcoin Cash? Or are you talking about the Bitcoin Cash? Bitcoin Cash and all the other forks that were going on and everything. I'm like, whoa, 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 I don't understand this, but this looks like dilution to me. This looks like fiat. Mm -hmm. But then what happened is they all got ignored. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. And they actually got treated like dividend in some cases mm -hmm. or free dividend payouts. And I'm like, okay, this is like a script issue and not a dilution. I'm now starting to think, okay, it actually strengthened Bitcoin's case. Bitcoin became the only one. Everything fell by the wayside. I'm like, okay, that was super interesting. Not what I expected to come out of this at all. So I don't really know that, but I do know that this guy's model looks like it makes total sense. And I think there is a finite supply of Bitcoin because of Convention. That, well, you can't change the formula. Sure you, you can. I mean, it's software. You can change it. Well, you can't because then you don't have Bitcoin, right? So if you want your stereo value, anybody is incentivized by money to actually- I see what you're saying. I understand what you it's mean. It's very exactly. difficult to not do it. I understand what you mean exactly. Absolutely. And I think that gets back to what is the staying power of the culture and the community, right? Because that's what gives Bitcoin its value. Right. Yes, and the larger it is, the more adoption, the more it's worth, the higher that power is. Yeah. The behavioral incentives are now absolutely yeah. enormous not to fuck around yeah. with it. So what's really cool about what you're saying, Raul, is that it brings up the challenges inherent in trying to put a value on something like this. It's so new and so different. And the way of thinking about what is the value of Bitcoin is so new. I understand that this model uses a stock flow and it compares it to gold. But again, there are fundamental differences between this and gold. No, but the point being is he's not, he's not saying that. Forget our philosophical stuff. Right. He's saying mathematically it trades exactly the same as gold. Yeah. It uses exactly the same store of value, precious parameters, a rarity value. So that's what he's saying. Right. And so he's agnostic when he comes into it. It's us who is now putting our anchoring our framework. It's like, is it gold? It can't be gold. But what it's doing is he's saying it's trading that. So if you say that, so to go back to your point is what is it correlated with? Maybe we're not yet at the price of where it correlates with anything. It's still going up hmm. to get to its hundred trillion dollars of value, whatever. And again, I'm not trying to throw out these numbers. I'm, these are other people's work. Sure, sure, sure. I'm not throwing out some random numbers just sound sensationalist, but but let's say it's still on its path to full acceptance of what it gets to its value. Well, then 
at some points it's going to correlate to risk off. Sometimes it's going to correlate to risk on, but it's just going its own way, really, which is a function of general emotion that you know human emotion that's in markets implicitly. You know, as people get overly speculative versus the amount of supply and demand, it collapses back again. It keeps rallying, and we just kind of keep going on this journey. And we're trying to pattern fit it because we're humans, and that's what we do. It has been remarkably resilient. It's been remarkable. I'm, I'm sure you know you're the expert on the charts, and it didn't drop below 3,500. You know, it pretty much just stayed steady after it it fell through the year, and it's been rising up again. I mean, look, every time I thought I've understood it, I haven't. It's clear that I have not understood mm -hmm. it every time I thought I had. And, you know, I thought it was going to go lower. And I really thought the forks were going to depress this whole valley forever. And then suddenly it's changed again. So I think we're all still scrambling to understand what it is. So, I mean, yeah, interesting conversation here. I have one more question for you on Bitcoin, which is what role do you think, and this is an evolving understanding, obviously, what yeah. role do you think it's going to play? Let's say we do get a recession and a renewal in the bear market. Yeah. sometime this year or you know early next what role does bitcoin play during that time does it for example do what gold did drop 20 percent in the fall during the beginning of a of a collapse in, in equity? No, no and the reason gold did was because gold is collateral that's exactly the point of having collateral right you sell it so gold is collateral bitcoin's not collateral and bitcoin's actually held by the people who don't have the money in the financial markets very, very so you're point. unlikely to liquidate it but what everybody like me will go I need to have some money in Bitcoin because it is an option on a future system. And again, we talked at length today. We have no real understanding what this new system is coming. We understand there's a lot of things that are happening right now and we need to understand or try and understand. So I think that is super interesting to me is the fact that it is an option on the future. And I think gold will trade that way too. So where does that leave gold? Gold is like the- uh... Gold is your own personal reserve asset. People talk about gold as a central bank reserve asset and, and the SDR versus gold and all of this stuff. I'm no interest. Gold is a perfect reserve currency for me, for you, or anybody else who wants it. Now, yes, can some government confiscate it? Yes, but you can plan the way around it. So gold works. It will always work. Nothing changes that. It has its own unique properties. It always will have its own unique properties. But you know the people who get into this argument of gold versus Bitcoin, they're barking up the wrong tree. Gold is a reserve asset for everybody, always will be, always has been. So move on. You know, Does Bitcoin fit into that world? Possibly. Possibly, but it also has optionality, which gold doesn't have. Your... Well, gold does have some optionality on the future system. You know, If we have to go through a systemic change, well, gold can be pretty useful to own in that transition period. Mm -hmm. So of course it has optionality. Does it have as much optionality as an entirely new financial system? No. Hmm. So let's talk about, there are a few other things I have here in my rundown that I want to discuss with you. And one of them is Europe, because you've done a lot of work on the uh, <laughs> yeah. the sovereigns in Europe and the European banking system. Tell me why you're laughing. It's just, you know, <laughs> I lived in Europe, as you know, I lived in Spain for 10 years. and You grew up also in the UK, didn't UK, you? UK, yeah. But then, you know, living in Spain when the Spanish banking system bailed out and the ECB forced them to take the... 10 or 30 billion dollars euros and if they hadn't have done it over that weekend the whole banking system would have gone in spain i was there i had to buy and i cannot believe it i had to buy a generator i had to have cash in dollars and euros and pounds you Don't bought forget, a generator in case yes and food wow because you know cyprus don't forget to shut down mm -hmm. you know our engineer here is from cyprus yeah and you know cyprus shut down and if that happened and in spain took haircuts yeah, but it shut down. So if you think about it, gas stations, right, have huge amounts of currency, money in their bank accounts, but with very small margin, they lost all their money. People with houses, insurance companies, it became a huge issue for the system. Now, Cyprus, that story was never properly told. And if I had start, had Real Vision properly then, I would have told the story of Cyprus. I think it was one of the most extraordinary stories. And Cyprus was pretty resilient and recovered, but it was a shocking thing that they did. And we thought that was going to happen to Spain. And I was there at the time. So I know how bad Spain was and still is. And I have been shouting to everybody over the last five years, look at the chart of these European banks, including the Spanish banks, the Italian banks, and the German banks, and the Swiss banks, and the French banks. They're all going down. And month in, month out, they go down. Okay, that's interesting. They correlate to the European bonds. And bond yields keep going lower. You've got a structural problem with the banking system and its illiquidity. They've basically given all of their assets to the ECB. 
to keep them afloat. But the fall of bond yields means that everyone's returns goes down. So banks have no profits. Okay, so the share prices keep falling. But they've still got a bunch of bad assets on their books. So you've got a real problem across all of Europe where the assets never got realized. You're talking about the sovereign, particularly the sovereign bonds. No, I'm talking about the housing assets and all of the bad loans and all of the private sector stuff that ended up on the bank's balance sheet that basically the ECB has been taking off their balance sheets and trying to offer them a collateral and give them money, but they can't inject money back in. There's no velocity of money in Europe. That was a huge problem in Spain, but is that also a problem in Germany? Well, no, Germany, I don't know necessarily what's causing the problem within Germany, but something stinks badly that the entire German banking system struggles. So it is return on capital, it is profitability, but it's also debt. Because you know, if you have all the money, you tend to lend it. So the Germans lent a lot of money to a lot of people. And you see the balances between nations, and you know, Germany is the lender of currency. Right. So you've got that issue. And then you look at stuff like Deutsche Bank's derivative book, yeah, it's forty-five trillion dollars, whatever the ludicrous number is. Mm-hmm. Okay, and everyone says, yeah, but they're netted off. The actual number is nothing, or whatever, a very small amount. But that's not true because you don't know what the collateral is. There's a whole bunch of complications here, and so I just look at that. I look at the European situation. And I say they're going to actually need to have a political solution. There is no ECB that can save this, and this is why. Christine Lagarde, I think, mm. has been put in. That makes it? a lot of sense. Because she is, at core, an IMF negotiator, lawyer, and politician. What do you need to do when you need to get fiscal policy across Europe? You have to get some sort of fiscal union across Europe, some monetary union, which you've got, and you need to save the banking system. You need Christine Lagarde. So it is a great choice for Europe if that's what they want to do. Now, can she do it? Who knows? Will Europe survive in the format that it is? Or will some countries leave? Will Greece leave? Most likely. So I don't think it survives in its own way. It's an interesting point you bring up because up until the crisis, these types of crises, these types of existential moments were great for Europe, right? Because an incomplete, it was a work in progress. And the idea was we'll use every crisis to create ever closer union. Mm -hmm. But then the political will for that ever closer union broke down. But you've also made an important point. So this will bring us kind of to where I want to go. Europe is actually still pretty popular with certain countries. And what, look, I live there. Right. The Spanish aren't really arguing about leaving Europe. No, neither is Greece. No. But countries like France and the UK and Germany, maybe maybe more likely to, right? Yes, because there's a different incentive system, right? It's great for Greece and Spain because they, they've been net beneficiaries. Okay, Greece has not. They've had to pay the back downside right. of the of the beneficial stuff. But Spain got a lot of, you know, like Greece, new roads everywhere, new rail system, new everything. And that was Europe. Thank you very much. Yeah, you mean borrowing the money. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. low rates that allowed them to do that. Well, not only low rates, but actually direct investment from the- Right, from FDI the, also. Yeah, all from the EU itself. You know, direct investment in infrastructure in Southern Europe was a bonus. Yeah. So we all saw that. So yes, there's a bunch of people like the Germans who have paid for that and they wanted it. So it was their choice to have closer integration. So, you know, it's complicated, but the Europe is not as unpopular in Europe as it is from Americans and Brits looking out. Yeah. That's what one thing I don't, I don't think Americans understand. Greece, for example, I don't know how much investment the bureaucracy like the the European Development Fund or the I'm not sure what institutions would be investing in Greece. I know, for example, the German private sector put a lot of money in Greece, right? And that's obviously a lot of money that Greece owes. But I know that in the case of Greece, for example, one of the reasons why being in Europe is so popular is because they don't trust their own government, right? They don't trust their governments. That's right. Right? So they want to be part of Europe. Also, Greece has security reasons to want to be part of Europe. Well, everybody has security reasons, right? Because again, it's very difficult for Americans to understand it is within one generation that everyone was killing each other. Yeah. You know, and Greece has had its own problems within that time period. And Spain, it wasn't involved in World War II, but it had a civil war and a, a dictatorship. So people in Europe, they're quite enamored by the idea of stability. They don't mind somebody saying, okay, look, we don't, shouldn't necessarily splinter into small factors, but there is still a splintering going on, but they don't want to leave Europe. So Catalonia and the Basque Country and, you know, a whole bunch of places want to split from the countries that they're in, but none of them want to leave Europe. It's interesting. I mean, I think that's a great point. I think the issues of civil strife in countries like Spain or the UK differ, though, from 
what happens in some of these other peripheral southern eastern countries, yeah. right? Which Greece deals with Turkey. It also deals with the migrants in Syria. Yeah. Same thing with Italy, which has a lot of problems anyway above and beyond that. And then some of these eastern European countries which have to deal with Russia. Yeah. Right? So, I, I mean, I think that's a huge thing. What do you think is going to happen or how do you break down the probabilities? The honest truth is I have no clue. Yeah, I don't either. And, <laughs> you know, I really don't. I understand fragmentation is going to go on. Is it fragmentation outside of Europe or in Europe? I think it remains in Europe. Are some countries going to be either forcibly ejected or kept or chewed to leave? Possibly. The UK showed that there is no, anything can change. But is the euro going to collapse as a currency? I doubt it. And I think this brings us back to Bitcoin. This is bullish for Bitcoin. And I think it's bullish for a, you know, without being specific, I think if we can imagine a cryptocurrency or a utility layer, a trust layer, like your friend Dan talked about, that can actually scale and work, it would allow theoretically businesses, small and large, to be able to conduct, in addition to being able to use the trust layer for all sorts of new business opportunities to conduct business amongst themselves without having to worry so much about what's going on in the rest of the okay, world. Okay, so this is a question, this is an issue, is what is sovereignty in that case? In a digital world, there is no sovereignty. Now, this is something that philosophically I'm trying to get my head around because you need a set of governance. Now, can you crowdsource governance? Possible. Crowdsource governance looks like religion to me. What do you mean crowdsource governance? Well, because in a globalized digital world, like Bitcoin, you can't vote against them. You can't do anything, right? So how do you imply a system of governments of governance of stealing, ah. theft, all these things? And when you start- Governance putting... is essential. Absolutely. So, I got you. Yeah, but you can't have centralized governance in a decentralized system. So the only way of having centralized governance in a decentralized system has oddly enough been stuff like religion. So you need to create some sort of social economic societal not you see where i'm coming right because you know somehow if you're going to have a cohesive globalized digital world you're going to have to have a new set of socioeconomic norms because right now and i've talked about this in real vision right now if you're a pedophile you can hang around a pedophile world online without any repercussions from sovereign states because you're basically in cyber world yes you know if you've got a good secret service they might be able to discover that you're up to no good or a good police service but many aren't so in which case there's no governance because it becomes a societal norm amongst perverts that they can hang around online with pedophiles and it becomes normal so what is a moral code in that situation yeah that's interesting right because don't forget pedophilia in some societies was never morally wrong Sure. So what you're looking at is what is moral code? How do you build a cohesive societal moral code in a digitalized world? It's a really, really interesting topic. So that is interesting. Let's actually Sorry, get I'm less ambitious. Sorry, throwing a lot at you let's today. Get, let's, get a little, get, <laughs> let's get a little less ambitious and stick on money because I do have a somewhat of a, an evolving view on this. I think this breaks down into two particular categories. I think in the case of digital gold, in the case of truly decentralized money, with the least amount of governance, the most amount of anarchy, it's Bitcoin, mm -hmm. right? I think Bitcoin has won that war, at least for the time being. I don't see any other potential competitor in that domain. Again, what is money, right? What we think of money is a set of things. Now, yeah. the thing about cryptocurrencies, it means we can separate all of those things. No, no, let me restate it. You're correct. Only store of value. Bitcoin will never, ever, ever, in my view, this is my view, and yeah. it's based on I've devoted... A good amount of time. You yeah. know, I never speak out of my ass, but I could be totally wrong. And there are all sorts of other people that could have better ideas than me. But I just don't view Bitcoin as ever being able to scale. Yeah. It will never scale its base layer. The only way that it will ever manage to scale is with second layer solutions like Lightning, but that's not Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. That's Lightning. Those mm -hmm. are two separate things, which means they would have to build an entirely new financial system to run on top of this base layer protocol that acts as digital gold, which so is therefore, basically is like the gold standard. So therefore, it is the collateral to the new financial system. That would be correct. That's okay, exactly that, that, what Bitcoin That's a really be. interesting concept, right? Bitcoin is the collateral and the layers have yet to be built. Yeah, that's totally possible. Absolutely. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that absolutely is. And I think that it could have that role for all sorts of different reasons and in all sorts of different ways. But I don't think it'll happen by these second layer solutions, right? It can still be, but I think that there are, as you know, I'm an investor in Hashgraph. We've talked about it. I'm very bullish on Hashgraph because I think that their particular model addresses the second half, which isn't just the fact that it's a utility protocol and that it would actually be able to scale 
to provide the solutions for a lot of the use cases that we've been told about, you know, for so many years that we've heard about. But also it has a governance model that I think is enterprise friendly and that corporations would feel comfortable building on. And it's also transactionally it has the throughput and the security to work as a medium of exchange, right? Mm -hmm. And I think because of its governance, it can function in all of those different ways. You could build a financial system using Hedera Hashgraph with Bitcoin as collateral if you really wanted to do that, right? Because Bitcoin's not going away now. I think we all kind of agree. So in which case, it's forming some part of this future system. Yeah. What's part? I, I, you know, so I my, don't know. my guess would be it wouldn't even necessarily be the collateral of the future system, but I do think here's the interesting thing, right? Gold had cultural acceptance and social status independent of sovereigns, right? So like during the classical gold period, it wasn't just that governments decided to put gold at the center of global money. It sort of had value in and of itself, right? Mm -hmm. So I think first and foremost, Bitcoin has established the fact that it has some value. I think it will continue to have value, but I don't necessarily think that it has to be sort of the foundation of the global financial system. I think that there are opportunities with alternative protocols to do that. Anyway, I think it's super early. Yeah, and, and, and true. Talking. I agree. I I don't know. We're just observing, trying to attach probabilities, but even that's hard. Yeah. Well, I've said to you, I mean, this area, the reason I, I got into this entire space about two years ago was because of what became a technological fascination with the scaling problem. And that's really been my focus for the most part because there was so much hype and so much bullshit, right? So I'm only now beginning to think about some of these other things. Um, and I came into it the opposite way. I came into it thinking somewhere in this was the answer to the financial system. So I got into this, I don't know, 2012, 13, something like that. 12, I started looking at yeah, it. $200 you said you bought in, right? Yeah, that's when I first bought it. I've written about it. Because I, I wrote the first article of Valley and I hadn't realized because... I'm not good with the kind of maths that that plan B guy did, but I basically said, I imputed the gold supply and demand, above ground supplies, blah, 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 how much gold was still yet mined, did the maths into Bitcoin, said Bitcoin's worth a million dollars if we price it like gold. And at the time it was worth 200, I said, look, this is a call option. I may be right, might be wrong, but it's not worth $200, it's either worth zero, it's worth 10x, 50x, whatever it was. So that was then, but I also knew that somewhere within this was the financial system, and I'm still sticking to that, but I... I don't know the answers. And you know, you've looked at much more of the technology side than I have. And all I know is, yes, it's flawed, but a lot of things are flawed. That's true. But it's it's going up. Yeah. And it's telling you, and going up in this world means adoption. Yeah. Adoption in what terms? I don't even know that. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And more than just going up, it's proven itself to be remarkably resilient, flexible in its narrative. Hmm. That's also very impressive. It's managed to shift the narrative. It's going to be future money. It's going to be the medium of exchange, and it's shifted now. And what it is telling you at a top-down level is that digital assets have value. I'm really Natively interested. Natively digital assets. I'm also interested in stuff like, because once you can issue tokens and stuff, create currencies. So yeah. I could, you could issue one on yourself. So you're using Patreon right now. Yeah. So let's say you issued a currency in yourself. Now, we could all buy and it could trade on your future expectations of earnings. That becomes incredibly interesting and it could be on the podcast itself. So it could be on future revenues of the podcast yeah. or whatever it may be. So we can slice and dice and we can fractionalize you down to, you know, kids can buy a small fraction. You know, they all want a piece of Dimitri. Well, they can. So think of how that changes sports. Imagine what Absolutely. is Cristiano Ronaldo's value in a digital world? Well, it's probably 50x what he is in because you can buy a share of him. So what we understand is, sorry, I'm getting philosophical again, is what we understand is shares in corporations, which was the great breakthrough of the last four, 500 years, yep. 400 years or so. We're now about to change that dramatically into digital fractions of anything, of absolutely anything. So students can sell their forwards on their income, you could buy coins. There's this whole thing is basically, you know, the fractional private chess ownership was just the start. You know, how we've done the same with cloud and storage and all of this stuff, the mm -hmm. fractionalization and digitalization Absolutely. of the world. Everything can have a value. So all of these things can trade. So a stock exchange of the future has gazillions of assets. I could trade French kids over Swedish kids because I think French kids get a better education and so I could do one pairs trade. You know, incredible stuff. 
of extracting value from things. Yeah, that can and you be can done. create business models that don't currently exist. You can run applications peer to peer in the, in such a world. And this brings us back to again my interest in Adair is because it's a scalable base layer that I think can achieve these types of uh, use cases. But you could, for example, run applications that currently are server client. You can run them all peer to peer, but where you need to rely on a trusted repository, you can use a distributed ledger, right? So it changes the opportunities. And I think all of those go to that on that side. And then there remains Bitcoin. And I think you and they end up being split because I don't think that you're going to have multiple. I generally don't think you're going to have multiple utility protocols. I think you know, you're going to have one really good one is my view. But I think Bitcoin is here to stay. I don't know for how long and I don't know what valuation, but I think it's proven remarkably resilient. We're just getting warmed up, Raul. Uh, <laughs> we're going we're gonna to switch to the overtime. For regular listeners, you know the drill. If you're new to the show or if you haven't subscribed yet, head over to patreon.com slash hidden forces where you can subscribe to the audio file, autodidact or super nerd tiers and get access to... The overtime, Will Raul is going to tell you exactly where to put all your money so you can get rich. And uh, no, I'm just kidding. Also a transcript of today's conversation, as well as a copy of this week's rundown. Raul, before we go, you are the founder of Real Vision, among other things, and you also publish a daily newsletter. If people want to follow you on Twitter and online, how do they do that? Yeah. So the easiest way, find me on Twitter, which is at Raul, R-A-O-U-L, G-M-I. So that's my writing business, Global Macro Investor. And that's why I write a lot of the macroeconomic stuff. I then also have Real Vision. So the easiest thing to check out, Real Vision, which is basically the Netflix of finance. It's an incredible, incredible platform of the smartest people in the world talking in depth about what they're looking at in the financial world, the opportunities, risks, threats, all that kind of stuff. The easiest way is just go to the website, realvision.com forward slash free. There's a whole free version of it. So check that out first so you don't have to pay anything for anybody. So realvision.com forward slash free. And I should also mention to listeners, that Ben Hunt, last week's guest, did an episode about a year ago with Grant Williams on Real Vision, as have a number of our previous guests, Lacey Hunt, Josh Wolf, et cetera. And I believe actually Josh Wolf will be doing one very soon with yes, uh, Real Vision. Next week, so the week Great. of the 24th. So, yes. So, Raul, thank you so much for coming on the show and stick around. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Really enjoyed it. Today's episode of Hidden Forces was recorded at Creative Media Design Studio in New York City. For more information about this week's episode, or if you want easy access to related programming, visit our website at hiddenforces.io and subscribe to our free email list. If you want access to overtime segments, episode transcripts, and show rundowns full of links and detailed information related to each and every episode, check out our premium subscription available through the Hidden Forces website or through our Patreon page at patreon.com slash hidden forces. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. Join the conversation at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.